Hi guys, welcome back to the weekly podcast. I'm Councillor Premier with co-host Councillor Andrew Rudge. So we were discussing the Absana Begum uh, trial and uh, like uh, dramatically last Friday, the, the main plank of the council's prosecution collapsed because they didn't have a strict definition. So, and Andrew, sorry, I was cutting you off when we had to go into a break. Do you want to just um, yeah, so, continue so with a, your point? Another key point, and I said it in that bit that you may have lost. So within the council housing team, there are also differences of opinion about how to interpret it. And one of the things the investigator found was that there were those differences. And he sort of said that the prosecution would be ripped to shreds. And in, so this is a council's own investigator preparing the, the case at the very beginning, saying the council would be ripped to shreds in court because of this, this difference of opinion within, uh, within the council. But I think the other thing that's worth reading out is, is all three charges were, were fraud related. And the judge read out, how do you prove fraud? Um, and she said it's A, B, C, and D. So A is that uh, you have to confirm that Absana, Absana had a duty to disclose facts, uh, for example, a change in circumstances and all the rest of it. And both the defense and the prosecution both agreed that, yes, she had that duty. So there's no doubt about that. But then point B is that you then have to prove that she actually failed to disclose those key facts. And obviously this is where the defense uh, said she did and the prosecution said she didn't and then C uh, that she dishonestly failed to disclose key facts so at various points um, she was saying you know how stressful her life was so so yes I mean it didn't say this directly but the you know interpretation was yes maybe she didn't tell the council but this is at a period of time when she was undergoing enormous stress because of family issues or leaving her husband and then the last D is that she was dishonest in uh, that she was dishonest in order to make a personal gain. So the prosecution had to prove all of those four points in order for the jury to find her guilty. And interestingly, they didn't use the term beyond reasonable doubt. They had that they had to be sure uh, of those four facts. And obviously, the last three were in dispute uh, by the defence, and obviously the, the jury uh, believed them. Um, or didn't feel that the prosecution actually sort of made made the the case. Um, so another key point as that was damaging to the prosecution was so Absama Begum was employed first by Tower Hamlets Council and then by Tower Hamlets Homes uh, from 2011, I think, on, into 2016, but certainly for for a, a period of time. And, and during that period, she received 14,000 emails and she sent 13,000 emails. And what the prosecution tried to do is to prove through those emails that she had knowledge of how the housing system worked, that she understood what, what overcrowding meant, uh, you know, and, and therefore knew how the bidding system worked and, and all the rest of it because she was handling members' inquiries and casework and all the rest of it. And they printed off some of the emails as evidence of that. The problem then was is that um, the council took back in-house the contract for managing emails from an organization called Agilis, Agilisis, and the investigator was aware of this. So he said, please make sure that you save those 27,000 emails for whenever we go to court. And Agilisis then saved it in the wrong place. So then nobody can no longer access those 27,000 emails. Um, and I think that was good for the defense in the sense that they could say they cast doubt about what was actually in those emails because their argument was is actually she had little or no knowledge of housing issues that the majority of what she was dealing with was recycling and asb and all of the rest of it and actually very little of what she was doing was housing related and and now for the prosecution is they can't disprove that because the emails are gone um, so that, I think, was damaging both in terms of strengthening the defence case, but also damaging the, the prosecution case, their ability to actually sort of go through and find more emails to prove or disprove what, what she was saying in, in her defence. So I think that was a, another key point. Um, and one of my concerns is that we, we might not ever, you know, we might not be able to prove any fraud for anything pre this handover because if any council officer has left the council pre this handover, all of those emails, I believe, are now gone. And those emails were quite important to the prosecution case because it was their one, well, it wasn't their only way. There were, there were some job applications as well, trying to prove that she had housing knowledge. 
because I think that's another key point, is they wouldn't have prosecuted her um, if she hadn't worked for the council in Tower Hamlets Homes on the basis that she knew she had a duty to inform, not just because she signed the forms, but because of her work at the council. But the prosecution uh, obviously clearly weren't able to, to prove that uh, to the satisfaction of the, of the jury. Um, so that was, yeah, another, yeah, a key point. So just to give sort of like a lay example uh, for viewers and listeners, um, so, so the charge of dishonesty is based on your intention in, and it's implied intent. So people look at the circumstances surrounding you to see what your actual intention was when you did it. So a, an example is you could go into a shop, have, grab something, be totally absent-minded and just walk out kind of ish. And then you're stopped by the security guard, but you were just absent-minded. You weren't you, you weren't intentionally dishonest or anything like that. You go back and you pay for it. Or you just say sorry. Um, I had a really bad day. I didn't know about it. Then the second scenario is someone actually goes in. They scout the security system. They know the security system inside out. They might even work for the shop, kind of ish, uh, uh, an employee of the shop. And then they go in and they grab something and they walk out and then they get caught by the security guard. Uh, so on both cases, people look at the circumstances around, uh, 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 the, look at the CCTV footage, look at your background to work out what your intention was when you actually uh, took that. So that's, 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 that's the sort of like the test for uh, dishonesty, whether someone's been dishonest or someone's just been absent-minded. And the council was saying that she was being dishonest, but and the defense was saying, no, given the circumstances surrounding her personal life, it just it was it was sort of like absent mindedness given the circumstances. And the jury found the prosecution couldn't prove um, beyond reasonable doubt their case. Um, and, and that is the test. The test is someone's innocent until proven guilty and it's for the prosecution to make their case uh, beyond reasonable doubt. Is, is, is that correct? Do you want to add anything else to what I've said, yeah. Andrew? So perhaps if I go into to more detail, so I mean, another key point was again in 2013 when she moved from her old home to live with her new husband. Um, so the second count, the second charge was basically um, somebody uh, kept bidding uh, using her account. So after she moved, Somebody kept bidding. Uh, there was an argument. There was a change in the pattern. But suddenly, somebody kept bidding uh, until the final bid. I think in March 2014. And obviously, what the council were trying to say is she was now in a new home, but she's still bidding. And clearly, she's not overcrowded anymore because she's in a brand new home with her husband. I don't know whether it's a one or two bedroom, whether she's living, but clearly not overcrowded anymore. So, so her defence was, in effect, it wasn't her that was doing the bidding when she moved. And when asked who it was, she she said her her husband uh, had done the the bidding uh, during that that period of time. Um, and I'm not going to go into the detail, but a lot of the defence uh, was about the personal relationship between her and her husband, who is a serving <coughs> Labour councillor in, in Tower Hamlets, who got elected in, in 2018. Um, so there's a whole bunch of other issues, but but yeah, but there was a lot of very personal detail about the relationship, some of which has been reported and some of which hasn't. I mean, this is all public testimony, uh, but she was painting a, a very negative picture uh, of the situation and saying that her husband was abusive and controlling, was in charge of all her financial affairs um, and had access to her notebooks um, and therefore... She was imply she was saying that she believed that therefore he was doing the the bidding uh, for for a number of months um, and and you know over a hundred bids it was not like one or two this is this is a lot of bids so that was the kind of the second charge um, he was uh, not invited to testify by the prosecution so we only heard uh, from her um, but she made a number of allegations and, and clearly the the jury. Um, believe that the prosecution hadn't made their case. Because again, remember it was three charges in total uh, and she was acquitted on, on all three charges. And then the last charge was that in November, 2015, she moved back into original home after leaving her husband. Um, and what was interesting, so in, in the summer of 2015, 
is that because nobody had been bidding on the account, the, the council sent out various letters to say, we're, we're closing your application because you haven't been bidding. Uh, and they were sent to the old address. And, and she then basically had to sort of call in and sort of reapply. And she said she did tell them that she'd move back into her old property. Um, and therefore she felt that the council knew that she'd been living elsewhere. But when she reapplied again, it was again back into band two being overcrowded again for you know three or four bedrooms and the rest of it but it was backdated to her original application in 2011 with a with a sort of confirmation date of january 2012 so so from january 2012 um you know to the end of 2015 you know typically it takes three four years to go from the bottom of the housing waiting list for a one bedroom if you're overcrowded that's certainly the, the number on the council website today. So by tw late 2015, she was years uh, into being overcrowded. And the council's argument was is that she should have informed the council that she hadn't been overcrowded for the previous two years. Um, and her argument was is that she had informed the, the council. And clearly, the jury didn't believe the prosecution had made their case on, on that point either, which is why she then quite quickly after bidding in November 2015, I think by March 2016, she had got her, her new one-bedroom property. Cool. So we're going to go uh, slightly, it's going to break. I've got someone at the door ringing away <laughs> badly. Um, I, I, I hope, hope it's not someone from the council's legal department <laughs> kind of ish. Uh, but we're going to go straight into a break. After the break, we're going to basically um, um, continue with our discussion. <laughs> 